We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop patron Kevin Renault, who went over the website and clicked on Ask the Bellhop with this question. What are some games that didn't appeal to you by sight, but you were blown away when you played them? Well, thanks so much for the question, Kevin, and your continued support of the show. I thought this was a fun topic to talk about. The one thing I do have to start with, and this is true of all our topics, but I think more so than usual tonight, this is going to be 100, 1,000, 10,000% subjective. This is going to be mine and Sean's opinions on games that we thought weren't visibly appealing. And please, no hard feelings meant. We're not telling you your game is garbage or it looks like crap or it's a terrible game what we're actually trying to do is hey you know what these didn't look as good as they could but were great anyway and like i said realize this is definitely subjective yes i realize most of our shows are subjective but this is more subjective than usual i would think yes in many ways i mean games are an art form and like any art form people are going to have opinions about this and just like any video game or movie or comic book or piece of art in a museum some people are going to like it and some people aren't. The other important fact being that just because a board game doesn't have the most expensive art from the greatest artists mm -hmm. in the world doesn't mean it's not a good game. I'm the game sure. is separate in most cases from the art. Though I do have to say, I do like it when the two mesh together, as we will be talking about in our review section later tonight. Indeed. All right, we're going to jump right to the list. Um, also, you know what? We love interaction. So if you totally disagree with us, we want to hear that too, right? Uh, we don't tend to say the little line. We, we will share your content, positive or negative. It used to be something at the start of our show, but it still applies. If you do want to argue with us on any of these games, specifically, there's a couple on this list that get hotly debated online. I'm all up for it. So my first game of the night and the first one that came to mind when this question came up was Suburbia. So there's a little bit of a story behind this one that I think is worth sharing. So we're in Toronto on vacation. And in general, any trip Deanna and I go on alone, like the two of us, we hit up a game store either on the way out of town or one of the first things we do, like the first night we're there, and pick up a two-player game to play in the hotel room. Something to unwind at the end of the night after doing whatever we're out of town to do. Now, on this particular trip, we hit up the newly renovated 401 Games, which used to be at 401 Young Street, now are not, but that's why they're called 401 Games. And we were blown away. Like, the old 401 Games was one of those, like, really long stores with tons of magic cards and kind of had some games in the back. They, like, remodeled this into, like, a warehouse with shelving and shelves of games. Some of the most games I've ever seen in one place. I spent so long looking for games that Deanna got bored and left, and we let her ma later met up at Amato Pizza, which Sean knows exactly where I'm talking about. Now, I get to Amato. I order my pizza from the 31 flavors or whatever the heck they have there. And Dee's like, well, what game did you buy? What'd you buy? What'd you buy? And I pull out Suburbia, and she's like, what the heck? Like, like with all the games in the store, the most games you've ever seen in one place, you bought the ugliest looking game. And I'm like, no, 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 trust me. Because at that time, I don't even know when this was, 2003, 2007. I don't remember when Superbia came out. At the time, I was into podcasts and I had been hearing fantastic things about this. Everyone, every podcast, like, you got to try Superbia. Oh, it's so good. That night, we try it out. And yes, it is so good. The thing is, not only is the cover of this game bland, everything about this game is bland. The tiles, the scoring board, even like you get an expansion that adds borders. They're just like, here's a solid blue border. Here's a solid gray border. It is one of the most boring looking games I, I have in my entire collection. But none of that matters when playing. The game is so good, you totally forget all of that bland art. Your, uh, your time sense is uh, uh, fallible as always, as Suburbia was released <laughs> in 2012. There you go. It was a so, little newer than I thought. A little, a, a decade off, but uh, decade. the meaning still counts. It was only about five years from 2007. I don't know. Quarantine's messing with my previous year's knowledge anymore. Everything just feels like it was longer ago. Now, they did put out uh, Bezier Games, the pu publisher, of suburbia did do a kickstarter for a deluxe fancy edition that did improve the graphics a bit like it's it's a little bit more pop to it 
I will say it's still not great looking, but what they did do is they added this like really awesome looking tower thing to hold the, the hexes as they come out. And I gotta say that looks pretty cool. And supposedly the tiles are a little easier to read for what you need to know, like the little airport symbols and the office tower symbols are bigger. So I would appreciate that, but still like the gameplay in this game is great. Sean's played it. Deanna's played it. I am a huge fan of suburbia. I'm grabbing the game to bring upstairs for my stack behind me. I'm like, man, we got to play suburbia again. Do you know uh, there's a there's a version that came out in March of this year? Uh, does that have any updated art, or is that just a, a re-release? What I understand, that's the, like retail version of the deluxe Kickstarter, which I don't think it has the fancy tower and the game trays, but should have the updated art. And there was some rule tweaks to make things a little easier. Um, I can't remember. I read what they were, but it had something to do with the things like the airports, where like you get something for every airport everyone has, and an easier way to track that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I have to say I love Suburbia, but literally the I, I played it at uh, a con with D one time for yeah. my first play, and I couldn't have told you the next day what any of the <laughs> artwork on the game was. Yeah, like it, it, it's just bland, and it's not like bland in that you know tool. It's bland but extremely functional kind of way. Yeah, like it, it's it's not just to make it clear to see what's going on in the game. Otherwise, like a bunch of blank tiles with just icons in the middle would probably work better. Yep. Well, that was suburbia now the next game that popped into my head right away was brass from martin wallace now the original version just called brass not the new brass lancashire version i love brass it is honestly one of the best games in my collection it is a fantastic game it's one i need to get sean to play it's it's a economic euro with train elements and route building and engine building and upgrading things and there's a tech tree like there's just so much going on in brass i have loved this game since i discovered it years ago and it wasn't right when it came out but not long after but it's always been hard to get to the table because it features one of the most drab and boring and tan boards you've ever seen. The thing is, similar to what I was just saying, like, you know, tool made it or something. It was very functional. It worked. It was very clear to see what the different icons were. And it was really easy to see which cities were connected to each other via canals or via roads. It worked. But man, was it ugly. Now, when Roxley Games announced they were going to reprint Brass and update it, I jumped right in. I went all in on this Kickstarter train, and it was totally worth it. The new printing of Brass, now called Brass Lancashire, looks a thousand times better than the original. Plus, it had the added bonus of some couple rule improvements, and then there were the iron clays that came with it, which puts that's still a step above every type of currency ever in any game ever. And then they even put out a new version of the game, which added new elements to it, like beer and having to feed beer to your workers in Brass Birmingham. Now, what I thought was funny about this, and I kind of feel like a board game hipster saying this, but like everyone was suddenly into Brass and everyone loved it. And I was always sitting back there. I'm like, oh, I like Brass before it was cool. But I am really happy to see more people discovering this fantastic Martin Wallace game. And that was Brass. Now, next up, we have Terraforming Mars. Now, while this game is one of our whole team's top favorite games, and one we play physically, digitally, and pretty much make sure to throw down at any public mm -hmm. play event, it is not a visually well-designed no. game. The card layouts are skewed, the images are mismatched across the entire game and lousy quality in many cases. It's a game that is quite easy to dismiss on a visual level mm -hmm. as cheap and forgettable until you play it. Now, while it does have its haters, we stand by it as a great game, even if you need to ignore the art and even upgrade some of the components to really enjoy it. I totally agree with that. Um, a lot of the art in Terraforming Mars is stock art, and people hate it for that. I will admit, I, I don't know what it was about this game, maybe because I enjoy heavier Euros. It never bothered me. It never bothered me at all. And I never even thought of it as drab. But again, I heard about the game ahead of time, and I heard the hype before playing it. And I was really looking forward to experiencing this card building, tableau building, little cubes to represent animals and building bacteria game like that just sounded so fascinating to me that all a bit i ignored most of the artwork and i didn't even think to put this on this list this was a totally sean's call and i saw it and i'm like oh yeah like if not me enough other people have complained about this game yep and that was terraforming mars 
Speaking of games people like to complain about looking terrible on the internet, the next one I have is Castles of Burgundy. This is one you see all the time. And what I find amusing about this one, similar to Brass, is a deluxe edition was released, except it didn't quite work. I, I The new edition of Castles of Burgundy did almost nothing to improve the graphics of this great Steffenfeld game. I swear someone just took the old graphics and upped the contrast bar a bit, and that's it. Now, I do have to say, this is an abstract game, so there isn't a lot you can do to make it look pretty, but the color palette they chose is just, like, like it's druid colors. It's like all earth, earthy browns and more browns with some brown and a bit of light brown, but then there's rivers, so there's some blue and there's some gray and trees that are green, but the green's even kind of greenish brown blue. Like it, it is just such a bland game. There is nothing enticing at all about this game like looking at it trying to sell someone on playing this game unless they've heard of it or they know the name Stefan Feld no one's going to want to play this game based on just the looks of it now that said this is considered by many the best Stefan Feld game and still manages to spell sell despite that because it's also considered Stefan Feld's best two-player game so fair enough people love it but man what a bland game yeah no the castles of burgundy showed up on every discussion of ugly board games usually first in the list the first person to jump in and comment on a reddit thread or a bgg mm -hmm. thread was bringing up castles of burgundy now speaking of stefan feld i also need to put carpe diem on this list to me this one's actually worse than castles of burgundy while the colors may be bland there's little in the graphic design of castles of burgundy that actually impacts the gameplay it just looks bad Sure, some of the building tiles could be a little easier to tell apart, but that is nothing compared to the tiles in Carpe Diem, where with my eyes, I have a hard time telling the difference between a green field and a green building. And even worse, the border scoring graphics are smaller and even harder to tell apart. Every time I've taught someone to play this game, someone at the table has mistaken a brown field for a brown building or the other way around or the same thing with green buildings. Now that said, this is one of my favorite felds. I enjoy Carpe Diem more than Castles of Burgundy, and I realize I'm an outlier for that. This is a tile drafting game with a really unique scoring system where the scoring grid changes every turn, and you kind of have to like bid and plan ahead till like the end game, even on your first move, to try to figure out what you're going to score later. But it all doesn't work if you can't tell the tiles apart. Yeah, that was Carpe Diem. Now, next up, We've got Go Cuckoo. Mm -hmm. To most people who look at this game, they're likely thrown black back to playing pickup sticks as a kid. Mm -hmm. And while that might be a fond memory, it's not exactly something you're going to go seek out and pay modern game prices for in a mm -hmm. hobby store. Then you see something, someone playing it. Well, that's interesting. That seems neat. And then you play it. And as you deftly try to balance a stick 10 inches out from the container in an increasing web of wood balancing eggs, you're hooked. Oh, seriously. Like you look at this game, you're like, it's a kid's game. Why do I want to play that? And then you play it and you're like, I know I don't want to play this. No, go away, kids. We're playing this. This is, this is my game now. No, we do love Go Cuckoo. Now, another game you hear people complain about all the time, graphically at least, is Food Chain Magnet. Now, I will admit the art style in this never bothered me that much. The art on the cards doesn't bother me. It's going for an old school diner look. I have no problem with that. I, I dig the aesthetic they went with. And many people don't. So take that with a grain of salt. There are people out there that just hate the overall aesthetic of the game. But throwing that out, the board in this game is terrible. It looks like someone printed off a prototype that they made in their basement using like a, a paper cutter and like markers. Like they, they, they used a one inch grid and colored things in with pencil crayons. The thing is though, it works. It works really well because it does that whole thing where it gets out of the way. Like you, you don't, you're not distracted by the fancy graphics. It's really easy to look down and go, well, someone has a tile on that. So they own it. And that's obviously a billboard. And that place is looking for pizza. It's very clear. So fair enough. I get that. Uh, there, there's no second guessing. Everything's clear, but it really could use a bit more flash. And then the biggest complaint people have about this is the price. This is a splatter game. 
And splatter games fall into a category called heirloom games. They're, they're, they're games that are created for a small audience at small print runs at prices of that. They're not mass produced. They're not printing thousands of copies. Maybe they're printing 1,000 copies. And then when they sell out, maybe they'll print another thousand. And to be honest, it kind of is made in someone's basement in a way. So I understand where people are coming from, especially at that price, you expect more. But then splattered games play so well for those people who enjoy heavier games. If you enjoy heavy games, you're, the, the joy I have playing Food Chain Magnet way more than makes up for the lousy art. Those still come on those those board tiles. Give me something like like I, I don't know. Color code the roads black. I don't know. Something, anything. See, I to me. Food Chain Magnet has gone with a very specific style that is very clean and minimalist, and they stuck with it for better or worse. And, you know, again, you get people hating on it and you get mm -hmm. people loving it. But either way, that is Food Chain Magnet. Now, jumping to games I never hear anyone talk about is Hacienda. This is a game that never took off. You never see anyone talking about it. And I think the main reason for that is because the game doesn't look appealing at all. It looks like a boring Euro game with a bunch of hex tiles and different colors and chits with animals on them all being placed on a map that looks like a desert with a dog bone in it. If you played the game, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't represent a real territory. It's all abstract to make sure everything's balanced. The thing is, this is a real hidden gem. This is actually one of my wife's favorite games. It's a really solid, especially for something that came out in 2005. Now, this is an old Rio Grande Euro, and you expect it to have a certain look, but even for an old Rio Grande Euro, this looks bad. I would love to see a deluxe, not, not even deluxe, just someone reprint it with some modern aesthetics. Yeah. So uh, 2019, second edition came out. Oh, uh, there you and, go. And, and it has been, I don't know, but improved, but it is different. <laughs> So, uh, again, it, it's definitely more colorful. I don't know right. whether that's good or bad. I don't know the game well enough to say. But, yes, uh, 2019 White Goblin Games published White Hacienda 2nd Edition. I've never even heard of that company. So that's it. at least someone else out there loves it. I'm, I'm happy just knowing that. Like, this was a game that we discovered. We're going back to Toronto and on vacation at the Harry Tarantula, where we walked in there. And someone behind the counter, we were, we, we were new to Euros at the time, like like still fairly new. Like I played Catan and I, I knew Aaliyah was a name to watch for. And at that point, I had collected all the big ones, right? I had Princes of Florence. I had Raw. I had all those big ones. And we went into the store and I told them, I'm like, I like these kinds of games. And the awesome person behind the counter was like, you want this, Hacienda. And I looked at it and went, really? Are you sure? <laughs> like, no, no, you want this. And we bought it. And it was one of them went back to the hotel room like, well, that was awesome. Great suggestion. So thumbs up to whoever that was working at Harry Tarantula that night. <laughs> and that was Hacienda. Now, next up, we've got Tyrants of the Underdark, which I finally <laughs> got to play just a couple of weeks ago. And this game is ugly. And on top of that, it's hard to distinguish things between the ugly and ugly with a lack of interesting and contrasting color. Now, the one redeeming design aspect of the entire game is the assassin figures, which stand yep. out as apparently the only thing they actually had a budget to spend money on. The game, however, <sighs> is a D&D &D board game that evokes the ideas of its theme explicitly through its play, and unlike some other games, is so well integrated mm -hmm. that it's hard to imagine putting this specific set of mechanics anywhere else. True. Which is a shame, because it looks like someone vomited grape Kool-Aid and clay onto the board and cards. <laughs> All right, I'm not quite that rough on that game. My problem is it looks like Risk or something. It looks like a folk on a map game. And and like the little shields technically are all unique. Like they shields? actually do look different, but they those could have been, those could have been cubes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even know they were shields. There you go. They're little shields. Your units are shields. Your little drow are kind of awesome, which is fair. But like even the card art, like it's it's like kind of bland. Like you got it's D D. And that was Tyrants of the Underdark. So speaking of D&D, &D, right? Because this game has the same problem. The entire Dungeons and Dragons adventure series of games. I'm sorry. These are D&D &D games. The, the, the system created for dungeon crawling with, what are we up to, 40 years now? 45 years now? 40 years? It's got to be about, well, how old am I? So 47 years worth of 
artwork and awesome D&D settings and, and background information to use. And here you get these plus shaped tiles that all interlock with each other with boring gray hallways with maybe a shield here or a lost sword there, a bunch of unpainted miniatures and the boring, most boring looking cards and tiles you ever see. Like, like literally like a card that's like black diagonal, it just says action on it and, and, and cards with no artwork at all. Even worse, the latest games in this series, the ones that are coming out now, the fifth edition is out, are ditching the minis and replacing them with counters. You still get miniatures for the heroes, but all the bad guys are replaced with counters. I just don't get it. It's Dungeons and Dragons. How are these cards not covered in awesome artwork? Like there's so much D&D artwork out there. With, with an entire line, like a D&D brand out there, how can they produce a tabletop game that doesn't look good? It, it baffles me that, that these bland tiles, like I would love to have used the tiles in my D&D games, but instead I have the official D&D tiles that look amazing. Why weren't those used for these board games? Like I just, there was a left hand, right hand problem. I don't know what it was. Now I will admit, these are not my favorite games. I, I don't, these aren't my favorite dungeon crawlers. So really, this is on the list, not because the games are great, but look terrible, but just it's D&D. How could it look so bad? Yeah, there's definitely some licensing departments that aren't talking to each other or haven't made agreements between artists. So you're they're not allowed to take, you know, book art and put it into a board game because that's a totally different contract or something. Yeah, but that is what you end up with with the D&D Adventure System games. I'm going to be killing myself for links later for just not picking a specific one. <laughs> All right. So one I didn't think of on this list till I started doing research, because as I said before, we actually do do research for the show. Anytime we do a list like this, I sit down, I come up with what's off the top of my head. Sean adds what he thinks of. Then I go digging to see what other people came up with. And either either sometimes I change the list, sometimes I don't. But sometimes I see something on a list. I'm like, oh, yeah. And that's this dominant species. The reason I didn't think of this one is I really love this game. This is a game I haven't played in too long. It's a big, heavy GMT game. It's it's like a six hour, right? People like to talk about Twilight Imperium being a long game. Dominant species can be as bad. I love this game. And this game is an action selection game where you're trying to actually evolve a species to survive in hostile environments before an ice age hits. And you get so invested with like the amount of heaviness just disappears because you're just invested in your species. And I tend to completely forget what the game looks like. So in a way, that's not bad, right? Like the, the graphics get out of the way. I don't even think about it. But then when you step back and look at this game and your entire species of primates that is spread around the world is represented by a tall cone and some cubes. And the board is just a bunch of hex tiles with little colored counters in the corners. I'm like, oh, wait, this doesn't look like a species populating a planet at all. It looks like a boring war game. Now, as I noted, the game works fine. But there is a reason why there are so many Etsy shops out there and meeple shops and places that will sell you upgrades to this game to make it look better. And that was Dominant Species, one of those games that ends up on everyone's ugly game list. Now, next up, I have Dominion, because plain is really what you have to say about this game. Just utterly uninteresting. It was released at a time when we were already used to the glorious artwork of magic cards. Why would you play a game with a bunch of cards that were so plain and didn't feature magical worlds and creatures, but instead some coin or a shield and artwork dragged out of like the early, early first editions of Magic the Gathering before they had gotten enough uh, oomph to get real artists in. Mm. But then... Uh, especially when it first emerged, you played it and found a new experience, an actual new experience, a new mm. style of game, a new mechanism. And while it hasn't held up completely in a world where deck builders are everywhere, this mm -hmm. game still provides a strong gameplay and a real important place in history, if not one on everyone's shelf, despite being out of date artistically, even when it first came out. The one thing I will say Dominion did right is it's easy to see what each card does. Like if you if mechanically, if, if you were playing it as a prototype and ignoring the art, which you tend to do because it's not very good, it works. The, the, the artwork definitely doesn't get in the way. 
and that was Dominion. Now, the next game I have was actually one, another one of the games that popped in my head right away, and that's Drop It, which sadly I don't own. I have gotten to play it thanks to uh, Queen City Conquest. It's one I, I've got to get this at some point. Now, while I wouldn't call this ugly, and this isn't an ugly game, but it definitely fits as a game that doesn't look like it's going to be all that interesting or fun. Kind of the same way Goku does. It looks like a toy sitting out on a table. But it's not until you drop your first couple of pieces and drop it and start scoring those pieces that you realize just how well designed this game is. Well, it may look like a kid's toy. There is a really solid game here. And there's a lot more... Um dexterity and sort of careful thought that needs to go into dropping these pieces than you ever would expect. I remember mm-hmm. one of the first time I dropped a piece and it didn't behave the way I was expecting it to, which causes a sort of cascade of uh, results. Mm-hmm. And that was drop it. Now, my last game for the night is a true classic El Grande over the years especially back in the early 2000s, the term cube pusher became popular, especially for Euro games. And that's due to a number of board games, mainly from Rio Grande games and Mayfair games that used cubes to represent pretty much everything. Uh, In this particular case, forces on a map. El Grande is one of the most well-known of those featuring two different sizes of cubes. You have your, your, your soldiers, and then you have your Grande, who's a, like the leader, the, um, the leader of your troops. And then you also have the most phallic game piece ever produced for the king. Now, what I will say about this is that it all is very functional. You can't miss that king. You are never not going to notice where the king is. You'll know exactly where he is for the entire game, unless someone's happening to be playing with him at the time, because that tends to happen. And the large Grande cubes really do stick out when compared to the others. So to be honest, these components do make the game easier to play. But looking at this game nowadays, just seeing a bunch of cubes on a Mac with this black phallus in the middle of the table just seems lazy and boring. Like I keep expecting someone, anyone to do an update of this game possibly featuring minis like academy games has even done this for their old cube pushers their their the latest uh 878 vikings right 878 i think i got that right 878 vikings all minis instead of cubes now and i thought i'd hate it because i thought they'd fall over but it does it just looks so much cooler when looking at the board i would love to see an updated el grande because man is that a bland board like cube pusher like you look at it you're like oh that's a cube pusher and that was el grande Now, my last one on this list is Draconis Invasion, which we've just reviewed. Now, this game is sort of a misdirect. Mm -hmm. The box with its dragon attack on the front cover does look intriguing. Yep. But then you get into the cards and layout of it and think, oh, it's Splendor with dragons and scary skulls. The artwork is dark, low contrast, and often indistinguishable from other cards at a distance. Mm -hmm. But then you play. And maybe the terror annoys you, but you play again because you think you might have a solution for something you noticed. Then you play again because you wonder if this one other strategy that you saw emerging might work. And then you're on your sixth play and you're really thinking just one more game. Is it a great game? No. Was it far more engaging than I had ever expected and kept me wanting more? Absolutely. Yeah, I was shocked by th- this needs to, we had a list. What are the, like the most surprising games you didn't expect to love? That's this one's definitely on the top of that list. But yeah, the, the action cards in particular, they're just dark blues and grays. And then we looked at some specific cards and couldn't even figure out what the artwork was supposed to be. Like, I think they took some big images and crop sections to create multiple well, cards. And they them. absolutely did. If you go to the BGG page for Draconis Invasion, they actually have uh, six or seven original art pieces. And yeah. they're large, like, like and they, high definition versions right. of art, which are then cropped down to a single, like, Instagram that style. That makes square. more sense. Now, you said Splendor. Did you mean Splendor or Dominion? Dominion. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't (laughs) think Splendor. Though, to be honest, a bunch of cards laid out in rows and columns does kind of look like Splendor. So I wasn't sure that. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Fair enough. And that was Draconis Invasion. Again, you can check out our review for that. Just went live last week. Well, that's it for our list of unattractive but great games. 
Let's head over to the lobby and see (laughs) if they have anything to add. (laughs) Hello, lobbyists. What do you think of our list of bland looking games that are actually great? Are there any you know of that we missed? I gotta say, I was really impressed by the amount of interaction going on in our chat room tonight. There were comments on almost every game mentioned here. So I don't know if you want to scroll back up and fire through some of those. Yep. While you're look, scrolling back, I will mention a couple we did get from our Discord, a couple of our fans. Uh, what we do on our Discord, if you happen to be one of our Patreon patrons at any level, we have a private Discord. And what I do is I give everyone homework. So when I know what our topic's going to be, I'll ask in the chat room. Uh, and then I try not to look at it until we're, I'm actually doing the show notes because I don't want it to imp- impact um, my thoughts first. And so I have Bike Guy Dave said, Imhotep is this way for me a bit. Board is pretty boring and a whole bunch of little cubes. Blech. Personally, I, I don't know. That one, Imhotep doesn't bother me, but I can see it. I, I, I just think I can think of worse. <laughs> At least it's got the boats, like the little boats. Right? Yeah, help, there's there's little boats that. and the boats actually dock to the, the different boards. Yeah. And you stack the cubes look like monuments. I, I personally don't have a problem with Imhotep. Now, uh, Pax, uh, Dr. Donna says reflection comes to mind. It's kind of a cheap package, cheesy graphic design, but the game is really challenging and fun. This is one I don't know. So we're going to drop a link to in the show notes to this one. Uh, this looks like a, like a puzzle game more than a, a board game. So as reflection. So uh, Ryan starts off going back all the way to the uh, suburbia top, right at the top of yep. our list. Uh, sounds like Ryan could sleeve the cards for adaptation if needs, but a play mat instead of a board could be tricky. Uh so I, I think I think suburbia as a for a blind meeple could be a really tough yeah. one. There's a lot to keep track of. And, Plus, and it, it is not cards. It's all hex tiles. Yeah, it's hex tiles. And the positioning of those hex tiles matters a lot. Yeah. A big part of the game is what's next to what in your board and your opponents. I, I think it'd be a real stretch, unfortunately, being able to play that one with vision. Now, if the if the uh, digital app version is accessible. That might be a possibility. I, I don't know if it is or not, but there is an app version of it out there. So that's worth checking out. Uh, D is pointing out that the new printing has improved the tiles. Um, and Oh, it uh, has like significant. I, th- I had heard complaints that they were still pretty bland. Well, but... it has improved them. I don't know if it's improved yeah. them much. Okay, fair uh, enough. And apparently it's, it's supposedly one of Tom Vassell's favorites. Uh, so we've got uh, suburbia is good. It is. Like, it's a really good game. It's really good. It's I, just I, one of those games. You're like, oh, that's I, a good game. I haven't fired up the app in a while, and now I now I want to. Uh, I haven't <laughs> played my copy since putting a box insert in it. <laughs> uh, Razul's commenting on Brass. Uh, yep. Never saw the original. Both the new games. While the art is nice, it is very dark and kind of hard to see things. Uh, to be honest, yes, uh, but it's so much better than the original. I have a hard time complaining about the new version. Well, we My did. I remember when we review when we reviewed it, trying yeah. to tell whether or not there was a, a train track there. That's what I was gonna say. My biggest problem is on the old map. It was more like you, you had a really dark line and then a blue one, and they wound different ways. Right. The new one has them next to each other, and it is very hard to tell if it's a road, a canal, or both. And it honestly is hard to see. Now, as for the dark board, make sure you're using the right side because they do have a light and a dark side of the boards and one is brighter than the other. Um, That's especially in the other edition because it's trying to go for that cold look and it's supposed to be dark to be thematic. And I agree, it's not a great design choice, but it's just so much better than the original that I I have a hard time complaining about the new one. But yes, I get it. it. It could use a little bit of brightness. And Razul's commenting that his only issue with terraforming Mars was the player boards because of the lack of inlays. And that's a universal hatred for that game. Though, to be honest, when that game came out, inlays were not common at all. What I complained about is how flimsy they are. Like, I'll admit, mine have held up. But when I got that game, I was worried they were going to get destroyed just from being into the box, out of the box. But like for the amount of time I played it, honestly, good job stronghold games they've held up way better than i thought i had planned on laminating mine for a long time expecting him to get damaged right uh and uh experience i read move Horizon saying have burgundy to get a uh, tenth to get the, all the expansions in one box yes. not bothered I, by the euro aesthetic no totally fair and it is it's it's, it's definitely an aesthetic and I, I i don't mind it in some cases but in that particular one it's just it's blander than usual <laughs> And uh, Razul saying the original castles looks better than the deluxe. I, they attempted the upgrade, but made it worse. Yeah, it's 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 like it's, now it's more in your face. 
it's not as bland. It's more, eh, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Uh, Razul mentions he has the new Carpe Diem and literally lost because of the tiles being indistinguishable. Yes, they're, 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 you eventually learn that the one type have round edges and the other type has square, and that's more noticeable. But until you figure that out, like I, I, I am shocked that got produced. That someone's playtesting somewhere didn't go, I have a hard time telling these apart. You might want to do something. They put a big star in the middle of one of the buildings. I don't even know. Like, it seems like there were lots of easy ways or just make them so that the green field's not the same green as the green building and the, and the brown field's not the same as the brown building, which each do two different things. It would make even more sense if the green building was related to the green field, but they're not. It's just like they wanted to limit their, like it's digital. It's not like you're going out and buying pigments. You know, yeah. it's not like the, like back in the day where you had four color comics because it was cheaper. Like you're all using Photoshop nowadays. Just <laughs> use more colors, dang it. Uh, and then we get into our food chain magnet with the ridiculously expensive, super expensive, and looked like it was printed in a basement yes. with the expansion costing even more than that. Yeah, I still haven't picked up the expansion, though. I've heard it's really good because of the cost. I, I don't have the disposable income I had when Food Chain Magnet came out. By the time the catch-up mechanic, which is a brilliant name for expansion about food, is amazing. But I, yes, I don't own the catch-up mechanic. Now, apparently D thinks that someone must love Hacienda because she found an app version of it. Yes, we have had the app version. Yep. Which you already pointed out, there's a new edition, which I'm going to have to look into that. That sounds cool. Uh, so apparently it looks pretty much the same based on what D okay. saying. So it hasn't changed all that much. Again, I don't know the game well enough to, to come. That's one of the ones we should show you, but it's one. Well, now maybe if it's republished, I'll make, it's one of those not really worth talking about because you can't get it. And no one cared. But now if it's available again, if I, if we can, if we can affiliate it, maybe we should try it out. Now, interestingly, Tech points out one game he would never have picked up with not for our suggestion was the Duke because okay. the board just looks so bland. And in oh, hindsight, it's a, it's a grid. Yeah, in it's hindsight, not even it's black very and white. True. Yeah. And the pieces aren't totally exactly true. much. They're just a little tiny little bit of icons on there. See, it, personally, I found the, the pieces intriguing. I was like, ooh, what's this? Like, right. like, because the, there's a lot of information on that little tile with lots of little symbols. Personally, I found that intriguing, but I can also see it being like, what the heck's this? What's going yeah. on? Uh, again, totally fair. And there are actually discussions I ran into today about chess, where apparently there are chess players who will more, uh, more play with different pieces more like they prefer certain pieces and oh i don't oh. want to play chess because of that board oh no, i totally get that because my dad's chess set the bishop looked like one of the pawns mm. it had a very similar shape but there was a little cut at the top and it right. was a little bit taller but like at a glance i lost games because i mistook a pawn for a bishop or the other way around fair well, good to know I, I, i'm not enough of a chess player to ever really think of it uh in one way or another uh apparently oh and sorry hacienda does come with a double-sided board and two variants in the new version okay the original was a double side board as well okay. it, it was dependent on if you wanted it um perfectly balanced so there was a, the exact same amount of each terrain type around the dog bone or it could be randomized uh do, do, i guess we were talking about the magic the gathering when it came to uh yeah to dominion and uh magic the gathering as a board game should not have failed as spectacularly yeah as it did that that's true that the, the magic yeah. board game was wasn't bad it was kind of based on hero scape but they did a little bit more with it uh the biggest problem was the core game there was no deck customization. And I'm like, you can't put out a magic game without deck customization. That's the whole key concept of magic. And then eventually they put it in expansion with again, a single deck, but you could at least mix and match. But by then no one cared. And then they put out a third expansion that fully had like cards for all the other decks, but no one cared by that point. Right. Yeah. It was all too late. And that's talking about that particular, because there's another heroes of dominia or something magic game that came out that flopped so bad. I know nothing about it. Uh, and Razul points out that King's Pawn, though, talking about El Grande, my wife's first comment was, if this thing vibrates, I'm out. I wasn't joking. I, yep. I wasn't trying. Uh, that wasn't meant to be hyperbole. Yep. No, there's uh, there are a number of fan models to replace that yes. particular king out there. And I'm sure some just enhanced that concept. <laughs> I'm sure there's and, both sides of that. Razul mentions Hansa Teutonica is plain beige board, but it's a Euro, so it's supposed to be. Uh, yeah, I, you know what? I saw that on people's list and I thought about it, but I was kind of like, what else would you do? 
right. like, like, I guess you could theme it. So, so you're, what it is is your guilds and you're connecting trade routes and you just, it's a board with a bunch of different guilds on it with trade routes with so many squares between them. And then you have a player board at the bottom that actually looks pretty cool with a bunch of like, it's even got like extra papers on the desk and stuff. So that part's fine. And the map looks good. It's a map of Germany with these, these places that are in historic spots. And, and like, I guess you could switch the cubes for something else, but like you're building routes between guilds, like, like, wagons i don't know like it, it's it'd be like i guess people probably complain about ticket to ride if they weren't trains and they were cubes so i guess there's something you could probably put there yeah but honestly like to me it's not that egregious compared to the other games we mentioned tonight like it kind of looks how i expect it to look and to be honest though el grande kind of looks like i expect it to look it's just i can't believe no one's updated that game yet i think that's my biggest complaint with el grande and wealth the king and to be the king, the one game that uh, the one sort of one set of games that I saw coming up on a number of lists uh, that I prefer not to support, uh, but the PAX games look horrible. And again, again, the, yeah, however, the, uh, very... the, the author of those has is problematic enough that we probably shouldn't go into them. And I didn't want to put them into the main list as a result. But yeah, ugly games that some people love the game, love. The games yeah, they're, they're they're up there with the slaughter games. Again, they're heirloom games, small print run games. Uh, some of them look neat, but yeah, we don't we don't need to talk more about his games. Nope. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I think we're probably good. So so Ryan's asking a quick question. Any way to make Kingdom Builder more exciting visually? I, it is bland. I don't. I found the whole gameplay of Kilton Builder bland. It's not on this list because I didn't find the game great. Not <laughs> only was it bland looking, it was bland playing. Um, I, I again, I don't know how you improve it, right? So you have a bunch of terrain out, and it's hexes, and they're different colors. To well, they even have like they're not just colors, but like the trees have trees in them and whatever. And you're putting out settlements, and you're trying to fulfill patterns, whether that's rows or area control or pluses or whatever. And, and like you are building houses, like that's the point. Like that's why you're building kingdoms. Like I'm not sure how you'd improve it without ruining the functionality. Because like you could do the thing that they do in Clans of Caledonia actually does a good job of this, where stuff overlaps into the, the, the other hexes. But to be honest, it's got a really good rule in that game where if you can see even one little tree in there, it counts as a forest. You'd have to do something like that. And you can't do that in Kingdom Builder. It's got to be clearly distinct. But like that's the only way I can think of to make it look a little better is make it look rough. But then you get the arguments that old war gamers used to always have that, well, is half of the tile showing trees? Does it count as difficult terrain? Or if it's less than a third, then does it count? And you get into these arguments over what a tile actually represents. And I think in that case, King to Builders abstract. Keep it abstract. Fair. All right. All right. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. 